uh, your assignments in, uh, in this and other subjects. Um, so I hope you, you did enjoy yourself though over that period. Great to see the weather improve. Uh, a few singlets out. Couple of the guys getting the, the guns going. That's all right. It's good. Bit of work required there. Um, but generally speaking, everyone's enjoying the weather. That's great. Now, what I want to do before I start is to tell you a little bit about a program that we run. Um, maybe not for you guys now, or at least for this year, but to think about in coming years. This is a, an amazing program. It's a program that I run with uh, Professor Jennifer Grafton from Accounting, and, and, and we usually have help from one or two others. What we do is we work with enthusiastic students over summer and prepare them for a, uh, to compete in international case study competitions. Um, we, you probably, many of you, anyone here compete in the uh, BCom case study competition? Anyone? One. Is that it? Only one of you. All right. Well, um, you know what they're like. They're, they're intensive uh, periods of preparation around a, a particular case where you work toward uh, a set of recommendations that ultimately you present to a panel of experts, oftentimes uh, members of the top management team of the company that you've just analysed. Uh, when, we, when we go to these international competitions, it's that similar format, but just again a lot higher in standard in terms of competition, also in terms of the depth and detail within the cases. Um, so these are the competitions we go to. We've got one in, at the University of British Columbia coming up uh, next year, Marshall School at University of Southern California, uh, McGill. We won McGill last year, which is quite exciting. These are difficult competitions to win. Remembering going up against you know, Wharton, uh, Georgetown's, uh, uh, Berkeley's, Copenhagen Business School, you know, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, some really good, National University of Singapore, some really, really good schools. And you're going up against the best, if you like. So to walk away from 12 schools to say that, that we were the, the best in the world at that particular competition was a really nice thing. Um, so, and, and there might be one other we add, we're adding here, the Copenhagen Business School uh, competition, which is probably the best one in the world, uh, we've just been invited back to. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in doing, I should say that it's a big commitment on your behalf. You've got to commit your summer to it. And by that I mean every weekend we work over summer uh, on these cases and, in, and during the week as well, uh, up until about Christmas, we have Wednesday afternoons, Wednesday evenings, uh, building our skill base for these competitions. It's a huge commitment. But the payoff for you is that we fly you to these competitions uh, we put you up in, in the hotels re required to compete here in these events. And look, that's the small benefit. The real benefit is the network of friends and uh, fellow students that you build in the process of competing in these events. Um, we've got an amazing alumni group as a result of these competitions, many of whom are already working with companies like McKinsey, uh, Boston, Bain, uh, Deutsche Bank, um, PwC, KPMG and so on. So there's a fantastic thing. Now we're going to talk a bit about this this afternoon. So if any of you are interested, uh, come along to the spot, Level 1 Lecture Theatre and we'll tell you a little bit more about it. But I'd highly encourage you to think about this. If it's not this year, maybe next year or the year after. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, it's a fantastic event. Okay, <clears throat> well enough of that. Let's, uh, let's continue on where we left off last, we oh, last week, uh, two or three weeks ago now, where we introduced the idea of the distribution channel. And we made it, the, the, I suppose, the, the single most important observation we can make about distribution channels, and that is that it's the one element of the four tools that we have, our marketing toolkit, our four Ps, it's the one where we have perhaps the least control. It's the one where we're all of a sudden devolving responsibility to an agent. We're asking another firm, another company, a retailer, a wholesaler, 
you know, a franchise owner, whatever, we're asking for another business, another person, another group of people to act on our behalf. And with that agency arrangement comes a high degree of risk, a high degree of uncertainty, and indeed a high degree of potential conflict. So in this session I want to touch on this notion of conflict. Where you have an agency relationship, you have the potential for conflict. <clears throat> now it's not to say within firms where there's no agency relationship the conflict doesn't occur. Of course it does. In OB next year, or organisational behaviour, you'll study uh, that very question in great detail. When does conflict emerge within organisations? But the potential for conflict is so much greater <clears throat> when you're contracting out, when you are asking another business to act on your behalf. At least with conflict inside firms, you can take the person aside and say, well, hang on, I'm paying your wage, you work for us, you're working with this team, you know, th think about it. <laughs> because you may not have a job all that for, for that much longer. Uh, I'm sure we could do it in a much more developmental way than I've just described. But the point is, is that it's a lot easier to deal with conflict when it arises within the firm than when it arises uh, between firms. So I'll touch on this idea of conflict and we'll talk about some strategies for its management. And then we'll finish with a, a, some questions around what determines the structure of channels. And I suppose from that, uh, that objective, this second objective, the one realisation I think that we'll take away from that is that, well, there isn't any real rule of thumb as to what a channel should look like. There are some things that we can take into consideration, but there's so many factors that we might consider, is it any wonder that we see channels look very different, very uh, um, um, diverse, in the markets in which we compete. So that's the, uh, that's the two objectives for today's session, or at least the first half of today. Okay, so conflict. How might it emerge? Well, there's this idea that there will be horizontal conflict. Um, as a firm, we will sell, by definition, to multiple retailers. We'll sell to wholesalers and retailers. We will sell to not just one. When I drew those channel structures, you know, I will have, they, they look like you're just dealing with one company beneath you. But when I have the, the, the level of the retailer, you can be sure that that's multiple retailers. You know, dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of retailers. There is always going to be potential for conflict that emerges between members at that level of the channel. Now, partly you could argue, well, this is just competition. Of course, retailers should compete with one another. But oftentimes, the conflict emerges because we may treat these retailers differently. We may provide one retailer with exclusive access to one of our products, our, our high-end products, perhaps. And a fellow retailer, a retailer down the street, we only provide our baseline offering, you know, our standard set of products. That can lead to conflict. Um, actually, a, 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 well, an ex-girlfriend of mine from many years ago worked for a wine company. And one thing she found was that uh, she had a lot of, she was on, in retail sales, she had a lot of um, retailers saying to her, why have you given this store down the road special access to your Mildara Blass or your Wolf Blass grey label and yet we, don't have, we only have one case allocation and they've got 10, or whatever the numbers were. Um, why are we not able to access that premium brand? Well, it's very difficult. Uh, you, you, you make an argument about uh, how we're cultivating you as a client and as you grow, you'll get access to about our better products. But clearly what happens is that these, these retailers at the same level are dissatisfied with the deal that the other one has got. You often see retail a conflict at the same level occur where a firm might locate or start selling to another retailer that's too geographically close. 
You know, retailers like to know that they've got some exclusivity around a particular zone um, within their uh, geographic zone uh, for their particular lines of products. Um, some retailers might take a particular product from um, a given product line and take one of those products and, 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 and discount aggressively, run with what's known as a loss leader. You know, we'll, we'll sell this product at a very low price so that customers will come to my store and buy more of my products. That leads to conflict in retailers down the road who are saying, well, we don't think that's good business. We don't think it's right to discount heavily one particular brand to drive customer traffic and so on. It might even be conflict with uh, an online retailer um, that's selling at a lot lower price or margins because the retailer, the physical retailer, um, has higher costs to operate and can't match those prices. Hewlett Packard found this out the hard way when they tried to emulate Dell's direct model, online model. Remembering that Dell has never sold Dell computers in stores. They've never started out with a physical retail model. They've always been online and direct to consumers and businesses. HP, on the other hand, had always sold primarily to stores, retailers, you know, your Harvey Normans, uh, JB Hi-Fi's and so on. And then when they said, well, we want to do what Dell are doing to capture more margin, let's go direct. Of course, the retailers um, were very upset with that. There was conflict between um, the retail arm of, of HP and the um, physical retailers, electronics retailers stores themselves. Now, as you can see, a lot of this horizontal conflict is coming about because of what the manufacturer is doing. And in some sense, you could argue that a lot of it is both horizontal conflict with the retailers at their level, but also conflict with um, members at different levels of the channel. So, for example, um, with that last one around HP, you know, yes, technically, the, ch the retailers of electronics and computer goods were in dispute or in conflict with the direct uh, retailer, HP retailer, but at the end of the day, you could argue that that was an argument they had with their supplier who was moving down the channel to compete with them at the same level. And so we often see vertical conflict where we've got this conflict between different levels of the same channel uh, emerge. And this might be around the kind of support that's given by a manufacturer to a wholesaler or a wholesaler to a retailer. It could be about, again, uh, access to exclusive deals or price points that um, are made available somewhere else but not to this particular retailer and so on. Um, so it might be around resources, around information flow, training, uh, uh, pr uh, price points, and so on. So again, this is largely all these conflict. This conflict emerges because uh, you've got essentially different businesses with different sets of objectives and profit objectives, profit motives, clashing with another firm. And it's not as simple as saying, "Well, don't do that anymore." because they, they don't belong to us. They are not our company. So we need to treat them, or at least manage them, a little bit more creatively. Well, how do we do that? We do it fundamentally by organising the channel. Now, conventionally, we have just acknowledged this as a, as a, as a reality, as a fact, that because we are a different organisation from the retailer who's selling our shoes or... Or, or phones or, or um, food products or whatever, because they're different from us, they're acting on their own interests, in a sense what we have to do is just uh, uh, isolate ourselves from them, maximise our own profits and hope for the best. What that does, however, is the conflict and the, in a sense, competition that occurs can oftentimes give away, uh, can give away a surplus, if you like, to consumers at the expense of the channel as a whole. So we don't, in a conventional channel where we just act at arm's length from one another, we don't 
in a sense, explore opportunities for maximizing value in the channel as a whole, uh, for the system as a whole. Um, so we can do that.